Thank you. Well, hello and welcome back. We are, if you're just tuning in, this is the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum's celebration of Colorado Day, um, Colorado's birthday. It's turning 144 today, but we're also very excited uh, that 2020 marks the centennial of the 19th Amendment, 100 years since the passage of this uh, amendment that granted women the right to vote. So we have a lot of fabulous activities going on today. Uh, we were so excited to give you a little bit of a behind the scenes at the museum. So my colleague, Caitlin Sharp, who is the registrar, agreed to give you a close up look at some really fabulous artifacts that relate to the suffrage era. So we're going to jump over to her in just a moment. But as a reminder, um, whether you're tuning in from Facebook Live or you are uh, registering through the Zoom and joining us on Zoom, uh, just make sure to check out the full schedule of events. We have events going all the way up till 2 p.m. today. So a lot of exciting things happening. So I'll send it over to you, Caitlin. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Hi, I'm Caitlin Sharp. I'm the registrar here at the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. And I'm so happy to be able to share with you two of our artifacts in the collection. So we are one of the few museums in the United States to actually have reform costumes. And we actually have not one, but two reform costumes as part of our collection. Now, a reform costume is what we would commonly call a bloomer suit. So they are um, a kind of a, a beginning stages of women being able to have a little bit more freedom to how they dress. Um, now, the two that we have in our collection were donated by Prudence Sinton Nick, and she was donated in, and she donated them in 1974. Now they actually belonged to her grandmother, Anne Bartlett Taylor, and she was a Quaker who actually lived in Erie County, um, New York, right outside of Buffalo. Um, we don't know much about her, but we do know that she was a me member of um, both Quakers, but also she was a um, member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, so later on, you might hear a little bit about the connections of what women who were involved in the Women's Christian Temperance Uni Union tended to kind of become um, women who were involved in women's rights. So there is a kind of interesting connection there. Now, the bloomer suit itself is really interesting because women at the time, what they wore was really tons and tons of layers of clothing. Um, these were primarily what middle class to upper class women would wear, where you didn't really create a natural shape, but you really were creating an artificial shape. And that was by using um, corsets, many petticoats, layers of skirts, um, all of which would become really, really restrictive. It was heavy. Um, when a woman was wearing all this, they couldn't move very easily. Running was pretty impossible. Um, going upstairs is impossible. There are also tons of stories of women actually having their skirts catch on fire. Um, there was all sorts of danger. Skirts could pick up a whole bunch of nasty dirt and debris when you were moving. Um, and of course, corsets, you're probably all very familiar with how harmful they can be. Um, they actually would suck a waste in basically. So they would kind of restrict air supply, compress 
um, some of the muscles that are in there. Um, women actually would sometimes have some muscular atrophy just because they wouldn't be using their muscles in there. Um, and it would cause lots of kind of just damage kind of to women's internal structure. Um, so reform suits were brought about as kind of a way to improve upon this, really kind of for their health benefits. Um, we don't know when the first reform suit would began kind of in the United States, um, but it's believed that it was actually from water curists um, and kind of members of health reform sanitarium communities in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, so they basically were taking those styles that women in like um, Syria and also Turkey were wearing. So they actually would wear pants there. And this was a style that later on kind of migrated over to England and, and France where women would be wearing pantalettes. So they kind of took different pieces and different components to create what we have here. Now, if you look at the one suit that we have here, um, it's actually more of a, a kind of almost a, a satin type material, but you see that there is a top, there is a skirt, and then there are pants. So it's different than what a woman would normally wear because rather than having to wear tons and tons of layers, you're able to wear this kind of just nice skirt that's just one layer, but then more importantly, the pants. So they make you be able to move a little bit easier. Um, this one over here, you can actually see a little bit better because it's on a mannequin. So you can see the pants, you can see this actually had a, um, a the top right here and then a skirt. And then there's this one actually has a kind of neat little kind of tie that goes around the waist to add a little bit of a you know decorative part. Um, but these type of suits were beginning to become um, kind of well known throughout the 1840s, 1850s in the United States. Um, a lot of times in these smaller kind of utopian communities, water curists, as I mentioned, um, but one woman, Elizabeth Smith Miller, she actually was at a sanitarium and she was wearing one of these when she was receiving treatment there. Now she came back and she told her cousin, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and she told her cousin's friend, Amelia Bloomer, all about these really fantastic new outfits. Now Amelia Bloomer might sound familiar because a lot of the common names for these outfits are called bloomer suits. Um, Amelia Bloomer was actually the publicist for the Lily at the time, so she wrote about these. Um, she ended up becoming one of the huge early proponents of the bloomer suit by wearing them herself, talking about their health benefits, um, and really trying to promote them to women as a better option for wearing clothes. Um, again, health benefits, they were able to have more freedom of movement, um, and just a much, much better option. Um, women didn't like to think of it as the fact that they were usurping what women's clothing would be, but we're more, for, more so trying to redefine what a feminine outfit could be. Um, so that is kind of the way to think of it. Now, people, of course, were upset, though, because obviously trousers were something that men wore. Women were wanting to wear pants. Now, if you kind of make this connection between um, what women, you know, wanting the pants, a lot of men kind of thought women wanting power. So they basically put, 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 um, equated women wanting to wear pants with women wanting the vote and power. And some, of course, actually did. Um, so they did catch on. They were very popular. We know that Amelia Bloomer wore them. Other early feminists wore, wore them. Um, but after some time, just because they were getting a lot of negative press, a lot of negative political cartoons, um, a lot of kind of feminists and women's rights activists at the time really kind of stepped away from the bloomer suit, um, reform costume. I do know that Elizabeth Smith Miller did continue to wear hers throughout her entire life. So they did become a little less, less popular kind of towards the 1870s and 1880s, but there were women kind of still in other movements. So those utopian communities, water curists, sanitariums, and also a lot of women who were working on farms and out west, this is just something they had to wear from a more practical standpoint. So, you know, when you're thinking about it, you're having to do physical labor, you're having to travel thousands of miles walking across across the United States, you want to be a little bit more comfortable and able to move easier. Um, so that's actually some of these kind of stayed around in that format, but also in gym outfits as well. Um, so that's why here in the museum in the exhibit, we talk about Julia Archibald Holmes actually wearing this type of outfit to hike Pikes Peak. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of the history of the bloomer suit, reform suit, um, and kind of the two pieces that we have here at the museum. Um, now, does anyone have any questions? OK, 
Okay, well, thank you all for letting me join you today. It was really fun to be able to talk a little bit about these artifacts. Um, and hopefully it got you thinking a little bit about like how clothing can have power and kind of thinking like these men were really afraid and not only men, but other women were afraid of the idea of women wearing pants and it was very threatening to them. But in the reality, a lot of these women just wanted a new option. Um, to have more freedom and be able to actually move and exercise and enjoy life a little bit more. So that's kind of, I think, a big takeaway of this. Caitlin, thank you so much for sharing these amazing artifacts with us. Um, of course, the One Bloomer Girl costume is on display, as you mentioned. And if you get a chance, you can come in and see this fabulous costume and learn a little bit more about Julia Archibald Holmes in our exhibit. Um, so please register, come in, uh, grab one of those spots and see this fabulous exhibit whenever you get a chance. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for your time. Um, we are gonna take a little bit of a break here and then at 11 a.m. Pikes Peak Library District, a children's librarian will be joining us. Um, and so if you have kiddos at home, it's a great opportunity to have them come in and join us and learn more um, about women's rights and this history. So pop back on onto Facebook Live at 11 a.m. or of course you can register through Zoom and participate through Zoom as well. So we'll see you back here at 11. Thank you again, Caitlin. Thank you. <laughs>